The year was 536. Changes happened fast, literally overnight. People began to wonder if it was indeed the end of the world as they knew it. They soon noticed that their silhouettes didn't cast any shadows, even at noon. The sun was becoming weirder by the day, turning bluish in color. The moon had lost its shine altogether. Soon enough, it already looked as if the seasons were all mixed together in one single day. Frost and snow started to appear in the middle of summer. The ocean seemed to become angrier too, with currents moving at unseen speeds. At one point, the sun was only shining for about four hours a day, and it had lost most of its power. The rain stopped falling altogether, and the temperatures dropped lower than ever before. If you look at historical writings from back then, it's easy to see why people lost all hope. Since there was no sun and no rain, crops were badly affected. There was not much food going around for people or animals. Territories that now belong to Italy or Ireland, to Japan and Central America, were all affected by what would become a decade-long thick fog that shifted the planet's temperature. The human population decreased by about 100 million, while those that survived seemed to have lost their sense of purpose. So soon enough, cities collapsed. It's for good reason that the year 536 is considered by a lot of historians to be the worst time to be alive. It took scientists years to figure out this mysterious period in our history and what might have caused such a shift in the global climate. But with the help of an ultra-precise analysis of ice from a Swiss glacier, we might finally have the answer. The team behind the research figured out that the culprit was a volcanic eruption that began in Iceland. The result was a large amount of volcanic ash getting transported all over the Northern Hemisphere at the beginning of 536. This event was followed by two other similar eruptions, one in 540 and the other in 547. If that wasn't unlucky enough, the world would soon be overwhelmed with disease, which disrupted the world's economy. It took humankind until 640 to bounce back to normalcy. Even though we have this piece of the puzzle in place, how can a volcanic eruption on a small island cause so much damage? It turns out that when a volcano erupts, large amounts of sulfur, bismuth, and other damaging substances get mixed in the atmosphere. The larger the eruption, the more substances get sprayed into the protective gas layer. All these elements create an aerosol veil, which acts like a mirror. It reflects sunlight back into space. As a result, the whole planet gets darker and colder. And if we look at the data, it makes a lot of sense. Almost every unusually cold summer we've had over the past 2,500 years happened after a volcanic eruption. Back in the 6th century, these eruptions occurred really fast, one after another, which could also explain why the whole period lasted 18 months. This wasn't the only year that baffled scientists when it came to Earth's climate. The year 1816, for example, was also dubbed the year without a summer. Mount Tambora in Indonesia is probably to blame for this one since it erupted in 1815. This event was the largest of its kind in 10,000 years. As a result, the global average temperature ranged by almost two degrees Fahrenheit. Globally, a lot of events happened. Although, at the time, they seemed isolated. In New England, for example, because of the cooler temperatures, crops failed, so a lot of farmers had to move to the west. The demographic of the country remained reshaped forever. In continental Europe, the potato harvest was lost almost in its entirety, resulting in some of the worst periods of famine people had ever experienced there. Humankind aside, what could really be considered the worst day on Earth? Scientists have come up with this candidate almost unanimously. The worst day in our planet's history happened almost exactly 66 million years ago. It was when an asteroid about the size of Manhattan broke through the Earth's atmosphere and landed on the Yucatan Peninsula. People believed it happened somewhere in June or July. This space traveler created a 20-mile-wide hole in our planet's surface. Chunks of soil and rock were displaced, some even making it halfway to the moon. They didn't stay up there, though. 
Some came back at an astonishing speed, having been turned into spheres of molten glass. They lit up forests and large areas of land until fires were raging everywhere. Some got stuck in outer space and eventually blocked the sun's rays, cooling the planet altogether. What followed immediately were multiple powerful earthquakes and damaging tsunamis sweeping across the Gulf of Mexico. By the time our planet regained some form of normalcy, 75% of all species on Earth had vanished. The most famous of all, dinosaurs. This asteroid theory was first proposed in 1980, but it's still up for debate in the scientific community. None of our planet's other large-scale extinctions were triggered by an asteroid impact. What made this one so special was that it caused dinosaurs to disappear altogether, even the most resilient. Leave it to passionate scientists to come up with another interesting story. The impact might have altered the chemical composition of Earth's oceans. The seawater might have become acidic, and tiny plankton that sit at the base of the marine food chain could have disappeared for a while. What followed might have been a series of species vanishing in a domino effect. Top that with other events that followed the asteroid impact, like the lack of sunlight and the overall cooling down of our planet. Now it's easy to see why this really might have been the worst day in our planet's history. But Earth is millions of years old, and not all of them were that bad. Let's travel back to ancient Egypt, which was way ahead of its time when it came to technology, science, medicine, and architecture. A lot of people had access to education and medical care. They had an opportunity to do sports and take up other leisure activities. A lot of things that are familiar to us these days and that we consider to be quite modern were available for ancient Egyptians. Pens, breath mints, toothpaste, board games, and even makeup. Others say Athens in the 4th to 5th century BCE was quite a nice time too. People there had equal rights, no matter what their social or educational level was. And speaking of wealth, it was also distributed between people pretty equally. If you had lived in those days and liked wandering through the city, you might have stumbled upon Aristotle, Plato, and Hippocrates. Their ideas became the base of what we now know as Western civilization. Theater, literature, and architecture also flourished during that time. Italy during the Renaissance period was also pretty nice. That's when the country saw an economic, cultural, and artistic transformation following a gruesome period of famine and disease. Workers now had the ability to ask for better working conditions and higher wages. The economy was flourishing too, which allowed arts and culture to expand. Wealthy members of Italian society had enough funds to become patrons for artists, writers, architects, and scientists. Now let's take 1804. It was the year we got introduced to the modern railway, and our ways of transportation were changed forever. It was the year when Englishman Richard Trevithick came up with the first practical steam locomotive. It was the first time when a large number of passengers were transported over a really long distance. And how about the year 1876? That's when the telephone was invented. Can you imagine a life without your cell phone today? It was Alexander Graham Bell that patented the first phone in the 19th century. As for the cell phone, it was Martin Cooper, an engineer from Motorola, who came up with the first handheld phone. 